Well, hello everybody. Uh, I'm David Zuckerman, Lieutenant Governor and uh, candidate for Governor of Vermont. And today I'm talking with a few friends of mine about the future of Vermont agriculture, uh, where we've been and what lies ahead. And uh, I wanna welcome all the viewers as well as my guests to this round table conversation about the future of agriculture in Vermont. And uh, I'm joined by three Vermonters today who have deep, deep connections to agriculture uh, here in Vermont, agriculture history, uh, their own roles in agriculture. And we're gonna explore uh, some of the changes that are taking place in agriculture in Vermont and farming over these last few decades. And we're gonna talk about what does the future hold uh, for this vital sector of our state's identity, our economy, and our culture uh, throughout the hills and valleys of this great state. Uh, obviously, uh, we are all still living under this uh, situation of COVID-19. Uh, we're living under a situation of uh, social uh, tumultuous unrest because of the uh, racist practices that are still happening uh, in aspects of law enforcement around this country. Uh, but today we're gonna talk about uh, how COVID-19 has really highlighted the need for local food uh, and food security and agricultural resilience uh, whether it be from climate or from uh, pandemic. Now, I've known these three folks uh, for a very long time. Uh, we've had a lot of rich conversations, uh, how farming and food production has changed, my farm having grown over the last 20 years, uh, with thoughts and input from some of these folks as well, and ways that um, lots of farms are changing in order to adapt to the changing economic realities, the environmental realities, and small business challenges, because again, farms are small businesses as well. So I'm gonna start by asking each of my guests to share a little bit about their connection to farming in Vermont uh, and changes they've seen in the last several decades. And I'm gonna start with Roger Albee. Uh, I believe Roger grew up on a dairy farm and was, I know he was Secretary of Agriculture uh, from 2007 to 2010 and has spent a significant amount of time promoting uh, place-based foods, expanding agricultural markets, and really thinking about how best to preserve uh, Vermont's agricultural heritage. I remember seeing him in the office, uh, looking through old registers of notes from past secretaries of ag, always looking at what's happened in the past to try to figure out how we're moving to the future. So um, Roger, it's a pleasure to have you. Um, please uh, share some of your thoughts. Well, th thank you, David. Uh, you know, Vermont um, agriculture has always been in a uh, a system of change right from the beginning, going way back to um, the early times. In uh, the early 1800s, as Clark knows, we were the sheep capital of the world, merino sheep. Many farmers made their fortunes um, um, on, on sheep. And um, that uh, almost disappeared overnight when um, the tariffs were reduced in uh, about 1840. Came back a little in the Civil War because of wool for uniforms. But um, we won war awards and uh, world capitals for the best fleece, the longest wool, and other um, um, aspects. We did well in raising sheep, but we weren't competitive with the West. When the railroads came in, the, uh, the industry almost collapsed overnight. Uh, we became then the butter capital of the world. Uh, 1850, um, the butter um, <coughs> trains uh, once a week to Boston. St. Albans was a butter capital. Again, we won awards for the best butter in the world, but uh, we weren't competitive long-term when uh, the railroads came in. They could ship butter in cheaper from the West to New York City than we could from Vermont. And then the cities moved out and wanted to have fluid milk. In 1890, uh, the first uh, milk train from Bellis Falls went to Boston and we became the supplier of fluid milk to the Boston region which still exist in many cases today. And um, the New Deal came in because of the depression and many new programs came in to try to help the dairy industry uh, withstand uh, lower pricing and competition. Uh, the classified pricing system, the, uh, the uh, market order system, which still exists today. And uh, the old timers who saw these things happened said, you know, Vermont can never compete with the West on a commodity basis. If we do, we'll fail. And that's happening today with our dairy industry. We're competing with the West on uh, our large scale farms. And uh, we have some very good farms, but uh, we're tied to a commodity system that's tied to an old pricing regime that is putting many of our dairy farms 
out of business long term. So there's a need to new thinking. Uh, there's a need to new approaches. And um, we have some very en energetic and uh, talented young people that are doing new things. I call it a re renaissance of the past because many of these things we were doing in the past, it's what I call new people with new technology doing old things. But uh, change is taking place and it's always taking place. And our farms in the past were very diversified. I've looked at uh, the eight, 1918 period when we had the flu back then and uh, our farms at that time, they were very diversified, did maple, they did other things, they raised their own beef, they had big gardens and uh, they were able to, uh, as families, survive this period of time. Today, they're much more specialized in the COVID-19 is put um, in, in, in jeopardy many of the dairy farms. It's brought back attention to having more local and regional food supplies. There's been an increase in CSAs demand and also in beef and other products. So change is always happening, uh, David, but uh, hopefully the change that's taking place will bring back this renaissance we're all talking about. Well, thank you. And some of that change is even internet as you sit in a car getting Wi-Fi from a nearby right. location, right? <laughs> uh, right. So um, thank you, Roger. And uh, next, I'm going to uh, bring on Clark Hinsdale. Clark was the president of the Vermont Farm Bureau from 93 to 2004. I think he had another short stint uh, helping out a couple of years ago. Uh, he was the owner of Vermont's first robotic dairy milking uh, operation, uh, which he's now since uh, divided up into a number of uh, multiple agricultural businesses. And uh, Clark, maybe you can give us a couple minutes of, of either your history or some perspective similarly. Well, thank you. I, I um, went from uh, B as in berry farming to D as in dairy farming. And when I did so uh, 25 years ago, nobody in Vermont could hear the B because I'd say, I own the Shalott Berry Farm and they'd say, how many cows do you milk? <laughs> uh, that, that's always uh, stood out in my mind is how much we used to equate the word farm and dairy farm. They were the same thing. Somebody said you were a farmer, they meant you were a dairy farmer. Of course, that was a time and when we were the least diversified agricultural state in the nation, uh, where no other state depended on one commodity for not only a bigger part of their agriculture, but a bigger part of their gross state product. Uh, milk is a bigger part of our gross state product than any agricultural commodity in any state in, in this nation. So moving from specialization back to more diversification is a relatively challenging thing. Um, with co-ops to market your milk, uh, we've had several generations of market orientation bred right out of the farm population. Um, and a lot of times young people with college marketing backgrounds uh, can come into a situation and use their skills uh, to, to market things where dairy farmers are used to not having to market anything. So we'll get talking later about um, some of the exciting opportunities personally I've had to work with young farmers uh, who are doing many different things. Um, so. I've been for 30 years of my life conserving land and helping young farmers get on land. And when I got out of dairy farming and we had our auction and uh, Nordic farm was a dairy farm no more. Um, a lot of my time has been sent uh, conserving and getting young farmers onto the land and uh, none of them are dairy farmers. So I'll just conclude by saying riding the school bus in Shalott growing up there were 40 dairy farms and now we're down to one, one dairy farm. Wow. And I think that's uh, so a statistic that unfortunately can be stated in far too many towns, uh, whether it's 40 to one or 50 to five or something to that effect. Um, thank you, Clark. And our, our third, and final guest uh, as we get into this conversation is Orly Munzing. Uh, Orly is the founder, founder of Strolling of the Heifers, which uh, started as a Brattleboro parade 
uh, and has since guided the organization to be a huge um, celebration, not only of Vermont's cows and dairy farms, but into a year round effort uh, supporting Vermont agriculture in all its diversity. And uh, Orly, uh, welcome and please share some of your thoughts on what you've experienced doing that for many, many years. My background is a little lighter than Rogers and Clark. Um, I think I was um, a farmer living in Vermont in my previous life. Um, but I've always uh, been drawn to Vermont. I used to visit Vermont a great deal. I worked internationally. I worked uh, in Boston in my younger years. But something always pulled me back to Vermont. And I decided to move here. And the reason I moved here was because of the farms that created the fabric, that created the anchor for our communities. We're a very different place than any other place. And it's because of all the farms that we have that provide us that culture. Uh, old fashioned, really good, uh, sustainable way of living on the whole. So about 20, 21 years ago, uh, I was talking to my neighbor, Dwight Miller, who owns an orchard in uh, Dummerson, Vermont, and we were walking through the orchard. And, uh, you know, I'm always like, oh my God, look, look at the beautiful view. You work so hard and so forth. And he goes, Orly, in his wonderful native twain, he says, you like what you see? Oh, yes. Thank you so much. He said, then you have to get to work and start telling your friends that they need to support farmers. Because if you don't, you see this, this is not gonna be here. And that really resonated with me. And he knew that I had a background in creating um, uh, conferences for teachers and so forth. So I went home and thought about it. I read a lot about agriculture. There's a lot written about agriculture and so forth, but I don't think people were paying that much attention to it. So a light bulb moment came and um, I thought of this strolling of the heifers. I visited Papoma, Spain when I was uh, working internationally. And I decided, hey, this is a wonderful way of celebrating dairy farming and farmers in Vermont, capture people's imagination. And then when, whatever we do, we bring home the importance of supporting farmers. And so we had our first um, Strolling of the Heifer Parade in 2002. The word locavore wasn't even around. That wasn't even uh, created till 2005. Um, it was a huge success. You know, Diane Sawyer, Katie Couric, other shows we were, we were invited. I remember taking Helen Robb and Charlie Robb with me. It was, it was quite the um, exciting piece. And it has been very, very successful. And we have consistently listened to the public, consistently listened to the farmers. And from those heifers marching in line, and we had no problem getting heifers um, the first five years. And I'll, I'll talk about that more. And they were all from Wyndham County. And we had about 155 heifers at that time. More on that later. But um, the program has grown. And um, you know now we have all kinds of different programs that are sustainable and help with um, economic development for farmers and for our communities. So that yeah. my, my um, uh, whole participation is, is much lighter, but um, I see myself as a concerned citizen of making sure that our farms um, are still around for many, many, many years. Wow, well, thank you, Orly. And, um, you know, we've, We've talked a bit about now about the past, uh, and some of this information was was put out there by uh, each of our guests. Uh, we know uh, we are from sheep farming to dairy farming. Uh, as Clark mentioned, uh, we are the most we still are the most single commodity de uh, dependent state. At one time, it was about 85 percent of agricultural output in Vermont was dairy. Now it's between 70 and 75 percent, but no other state is above 50 percent with any one commodity. So we are still highly uh, focused uh, when you look at our economy, even with all the diversified farms. Um, so I'm curious, 
uh, dairy farming still being such an important piece of Vermont's economy, uh, what are, let's talk about some of the challenges facing the dairy farms and the dairy industry here in Vermont. And do you know any practices or solutions that are being tried that are maybe moving to a stronger resilience from the commodity market uh, throughout uh, dairy industry? Any one of you, if you want to chime in a little bit. Well, certainly uh, in, in the Charlotte area, uh, we've seen the uh, attitude expressed by Orly Munzing, the attitude of uh, shopping local, embracing uh, the farming community happened to a significant degree. Um, and uh, uh, we have a half a dozen farmers or so that raise beef. And in this COVID-19 era, when many of the big packing houses have been shut down, um, the the, the local beef farmers here in our area uh, can't keep up, can't keep meat in inventory. Uh, and um, I went to a small farm stand a few weeks ago, you know, where only two people could social distance inside, but yet there was five people at six foot intervals waiting for their turn to get into this little stand on a dirt road and they clean, clean the place right out. And so one of the bright spots, and David, you mentioned this, one of the bright spots is if people first blacken the shadow of the door to a farm stand they've never been to before, or call on a, a front porch forum ad for somebody that's selling beef by the side, um, they'll start that relationship and make it more likely that that will be their source of local meat and, and, and instead of the chain supermarket. Um, so we're definitely seeing that. And as a state that, sh that ships in, what do we ship in, David? 80% or more of our food? Um, that we, we have a substantial opportunity um, just feeding, feeding ourselves. Uh, and there's a lot of growth that's available uh, for, for doing that. Um, and another thing being here on Zoom that I wanna mention is I have worked with uh, some young farmers where one member of the couple had a financial management job or some kind of job that they could do from home on their computer and be spend half their time helping their spouse who was full time uh, with their with with their farming operation, uh, and I think that's a huge opportunity because we've always had farm families where there was some off the farm work too. Uh, I even have heard of a dare, uh, of a vegetable farmer that moonlights as lieutenant governor. Um, <laughs> You know, so, uh, and the legislature used to get out in time for maple sugaring, and uh, we uh, might be better off if they still did. Um, but it was when there was dozens and dozens of farmers in the legislature, boy, when the sap started to run, you better start wrapping her up. So I think that there's a lot of opportunity going back to, as Roger said, uh, the, the diversity that we had a uh, 100 years ago. Um, and that we need to look more at our neighbors as customers than the truck that comes uh, down the road. You know, we've, we've known for a long time what the, what the problem has been with the commodity dairy side. Uh, we've studied it backwards, forwards, sideways, upside down, and we know that the pricing system doesn't work to the advantage of our dairy farms in Vermont. It hasn't for many years, Clark, <laughs> many, many years. And as a result, a lot of dairy farms have diversified. Uh, you know, some of them went into uh, doing cheeses, specialty cheeses, um, and other things like that uh, because of that. Um, and, and that trend continues and will continue, I suspect. But, um, and we still have many good dairy farms left, but I think the diversity and the, the diversification in young farmers is a trend that uh, will continue and has to continue. And do you think in that vein, oh, go ahead, Orly. No, go ahead. I was going to say in that vein, um, 
are consumers looking for something more than a commodity? You know, are they looking for either value added or animal husbandry or worker conditions uh, or climate issues and cover crops and water quality? Do, do we think consumers care enough to make those aspects of farming uh, an economic value uh, for, for farmers? I'd say probably. I'm not going to say absolutely. Uh, and, and one of the initiatives, and I think you were involved in this, David, and, uh, and, and, and Mr. Secretary, of course, is the whole push to get local foods in restaurants uh, and the whole fact that the menus in these restaurants, the websites in these restaurants uh, celebrate and talk about the various local farms that they, that they source their, their food from. Now, right now, of course, that is slammed as hard as anything could possibly be slammed. And it is the small businesses that are family run that buy local and, and much less, not, not nothing, but much less the large national chain supermarkets who have to run all the purchasing through through a regional warehouse. Um, and so um, I, I think that that group of people is very important to us as farmers and cross our fingers that the majority of these small restaurants can make it back because they're much better at reaching out to local farmers uh, than the national chains. Orla, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I cut you well, off earlier. You know, I think everything was said here, except COVID-19 has really helped uh, the movement. People are looking to slow down. They're really thinking of where their food came from. Uh, there's a whole clean living movement going on now where people are more concerned about um, eating healthy, eating clean, uh, cutting down on processing food and eating more whole foods, vegetables, and fruits. Um, more concerned about knowing where their food came from. And I think that manufacturers are really looking at that and redesigning their foods. Um, I was just um, at our local supermarket talking to our, uh, the manager. I said, so where are you seeing um, your foods? Where, what, what, what are you selling more, most of? And he said, vegetables and fruits. And I said, what about, you know, those cereals and processed food? He goes, you know, that has really taken a dip. This is what he told me. So I think it's a real opportunity for us. And I think what we need is marketing. I don't think we're telling our story um, as well as other industries do. And um, I think that's really lacking. It's, it's, and it, and, and, and it, goes, it goes deeper than that too. I had the opportunity to run a hospital healthcare facility for four years after I left Montpelier. And uh, one of the things that uh, I witnessed, and there's a lot of work going on, is food is medicine. There's a group down in Boston, Community Servings, has been doing work with MIT and Harvard Law and Mass General who have discovered that serving local healthy food prepared from local food to people with COPD, heart conditions, diabetics, cancer, has reduced hospital emissions and increased their health um, long term. So there's a connection there that can be built on too, David. And also the organic movement. I think they've done a better job in marketing than other food sectors in describing um, how hard it is uh, to produce your food as well as the uh, benefits that you get from it. And people are paying more for it. Um, I think they're going to take a hit if our economy and more people are losing jobs and families have to make a decision. Um, however, um, you know, we need to look at that as a whole, especially for the state of Vermont that has such a cachet in the name Vermont. Um, we need to actually um, introduce and attract more food producers to come here and uh, produce their food here because of the wonderful soil we have, the wonderful farmers we have, and um, the name. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm still hearing for some of our farmers, whether it's folks that want to start dairies, because there's actually still young people that want to get into dairy, as well as other small farms, diversified farms, or meat farms with a little more land, that we're still facing a couple different issues around money. One is land in Vermont is not inexpensive. We are in the Boston, New York, second home, uh, country respite, you know, market. We're seeing that really strong right now with COVID-19. There's been a, a big uptick in uh, out of state looking at purchasing. And we see the economic return for farmers still being tough. You know, it's hard to make a livable wage as a farmer. So what do you, do any of you see as, as ways, Roger, you touched earlier, maybe it was before the show, but we were talking a little about um, current use and, and other land, you know, conservation. Clark, you're familiar with that, but what do we do to make sure the land can stay in agriculture from a purchase possibility price and that people farming get paid? The whole conversation around essential workers and what's essential has become a whole new, like front and center topic through COVID-19. Food, it's about as basic as it gets. Anybody wanna offer some thoughts on sort of that arena of the economics of farming? Well, sure, let me, let me talk about um, land conservation and, and current use for, for just a moment. Um, I remember back when uh, we were, when Housing and Conservation Board was just a concept and there was a group of us that were the Housing and Conservation Coalition trying to get a fund established to, to do these things that are so important to keeping Vermont, Vermont. And part of my, my little uh, stump speech in legislative committees was that the grand list of Greenwich, Connecticut at that time was greater than the grand list of the state of Vermont. And if uh, the business people in Southern New England and New York woke up one morning and over coffee decided to buy Vermont, by noon they would have it all purchased with discretionary income. So understanding how small and how vulnerable and how the 10 million acres in Vermont, that's privately, the portion that's privately owned could all become playground and second homes for wealthy people. And our local culture could, could, could um, just disappear. Um, the conservation movement has now been around for long enough. So I have observed and participated in second and third generation sales, the land that was preserved, the person it was preserved for, uh, retired, you know, got old, um, moved away, and uh, the land is being bought by uh, uh, other farmers. There's a piece of land that, that I had that was used as part of the dairy farm. Uh, then a guy bought it to, buy, to grow hops. Neighbors didn't like that, so he bought land in Starksboro and grew hops. But he tile drained the land, and then he sold it to a guy who is uh, growing hemp. Um, and the guy that's growing a hemp, you know, out, bought, bought his plants from others the first year. This year, he put up his own greenhouse to start his own plants. Um, and uh, so that I've seen that land go through th three, three persons' hands. Um, and the land where the barn was, where the cow was, were milked across the road, is grapes. Uh, and those grapes are processed uh, at Shelburne Vineyards. Uh, so Shelburne Vineyards, by creating that processing facility, has created a market for not only their grapes, but other grapes. And, and, and so those, those are all uh, very interesting things. I want to mention gardens for a minute. Gardens. In World War II, we had victory gardens, and it was a patriotic World thing. World War I. World War, World War One, too, Clark. Okay, okay. You're a little older than me, Roger, so I'll I'll, I'll take your word for it. Uh, and and uh, the garden centers, you know, it's hard to buy a plant or a seed in Vermont right now because everybody's staying at home. It's the time to have a garden. Um, I remember being asked when I was doing the shallot berry farm for recommendations on varieties of berries. And then they'd say, oh, you, you, but you probably don't want me planting berries. <clears throat> I said, yes, I do. The more people farm, the more people have gardens, the more people 
understand how hard it is to do that, how much better the fresh food is. And so this whole gardening renaissance that we're seeing is a real opportunity. Um, some of those people will go back to work and maybe not garden next year, but they're not going to forget how good that fresh produce tastes. And they're going to go buy it from Burlington Farmers Market or um, local stores like the Shelburne Supermarket, who are excellent at buying and stocking uh, local foods. They're known for it. So, so this is an opportunity we can build on the fact that a lot of people are going to get their hands in the dirt. And a lot of people um, are, are going to want to keep that theme, uh, localness, as part of their family culture coming out of this time. Well, and maybe that means economic remuneration for those farmers, because that's still one of the big issues. Uh, sorry, Roger, go ahead. Well, you, you, you know, you asked what, what might be done in the future, too. We, you know, we have a lot of programs in Vermont that have been put in over a long period of time that Clark has mentioned and, and others as well. Um, you know, last year, um, we put a group of 22 diverse people together to look at dairy and water quality, and they came out with a report in March 19th, actually, um, of eight recommendations. And one of them, which I think is, uh, is key to the future as well as the others, was looking at places like Maryland after the tobacco um, industry was, uh, you know, put to sleep, so to speak, uh, for good reasons. They created a, you know, independent uh, Southern Maryland, Maryland Development Corporation that uh, worked to provide grants and, uh, and loans and other things for transition, in that case, from tobacco to other things. Now we have Vita and we have uh, Working Landscape and all these programs, but we really don't have a focused collaborative effort around grants and loans to transition people from one generation to the next in the Working Landscape. And which is development rights. I, I would like to add to Clark and Rogers, and that is only 15% of the approximately 7,000 farmers right now in Vermont are 35 or younger. It's too expensive. It's very difficult. They have student loans and so forth. Many of them want to go into farming, but it's imp almost impossible. I think that we need to figure out, and, and we need younger people to take over because it's an aged population. We need to figure out quickly um, now how we can attract more younger people. I know I get phone calls from people from out of state, young people who are interested in farming in Vermont, um, and it's almost impossible. So it's something that we need to immediately solve. Well, well Vermont Land Trust did uh, invest in staffing a position. Uh, John Ramsey held it initially, uh, where they're recognizing that it's it's not just conserving the land, but it's having an economic use for it. And and so they spend resources uh, on um, identifying young farmers and trying to align uh, place them on a conserved farm. And in terms of the economics. Um, one of the things I learned through my Farm Bureau years and meeting farmers from all over the country is that our farmland in Vermont, believe it or not, is relatively inexpensive compared to national, national averages. Uh, friends of mine said they, they couldn't believe that you could buy, you know, hayland for $1,500 an acre. They, they couldn't believe it um, because in a lot of these states, Farmland is eight, ten, twelve thousand dollars an acre. Um, I think in sections of Oregon it averages twenty, and that's for farming. That's not somebody buying the land to develop it. That's the level of competition in some of these areas for farmland for farming. Mm -hmm. So I think the fact that we've conserved so much land and we continue to conserve land and we have policies about the land being affordable when it transitioned. I think that's all laying a great background for the future. And now that we've conserved, uh, I, I don't know, are we at 10% of the state yet? It's it's moving right along, but- uh, I think it's on the maps right behind me actually, but- uh, Oh, sure. Yeah. 
Sure. I know we set the goal in Shalott of uh, when we started 30 years ago of conserving 10,000 acres out of 26,000. And we're between seven and 8,000. So we're getting there. So the um, other piece, David, I know, I, and, 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 and Clark, Orly, yeah, Orly, Orly, go ahead. The only other piece I wanted to say in uh, conjunction with Roger and Clark about attracting younger people is we need special programs, higher, a la our higher ed uh, programs that uh, have been uh, discussed to cut recently and other uh, programs, you know, in a, in a small little way, what we're doing at Strolling of the Heifers with Wyndham Grows is to scale up small businesses like, uh, that produce uh, food from the farms or work with farmers in scaling up and adding value to what they're producing. And they're getting coaching, monitoring, um, and so forth. More of those kinds of programs are needed tremendously. Sorry, Roger, go ahead real quick if you have thought. Well, I, 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 I totally agree. You know, uh, the purchase development rights program is, is wonderful, but we don't have enough money to do what's needed. Never have had. And uh, so all these other things are very important that we've been talking about. So I somewhat alarmed TC was suggested to be closed or moved to Williston. I hope we need those kind of programs in the future that can bring young people the education, the hands on experience that they need to, uh, to help them advance in their careers. So uh, I wanna have a few minutes for our last question that, that we had prepared, although there, one was sent in that I wanna bring up from Facebook Live as well that asked, uh, are large poultry and dairy farms driving smaller ones out of business? And that's a very contentious question but similarly along that line, are there um, opportunities for smaller farms in the local food movement? What ideas do you have for guiding Vermont towards this more diversified, sustainable agricultural economy and, uh, and, and so forth? How does that, you know, those two things tie together maybe a little bit. Is, is, there, is there a division in agriculture? Does there need to be a division in agriculture or can we all survive with different scales and models? Uh, I'd, I'd like to take a shot at that. Um, as dairy is tightened, the competition for rented land is increased. Uh, you know, we're seeing rented land bring 80, 100, $125 an acre. Uh, down Rogers Way, I, I, I knew of some land that went for as much as $500 an acre along the uh, Connecticut River, some of that, uh, of that um, beautiful, soil. beautiful soil. But what the, what farm appraisers have found is that a hundred acre field appraises for more than an acre, more per acre than a 10 acre field. And that the large dairy farmers, you know, want fields that, that they can turn the largest of large equipment around in. They don't want a five acre here and a seven acre there and a 10 acre there. And so as a result, as I've sold some of the conserved land that I used to farm, um, we, we've had some small greenhouse vegetable operations that have bought small plots of conserved land that the bigger dairy farmers wouldn't even want to look at. Um, and a lot of times in our, in our soil structure in Vermont here in the valley, you'll get small narrow valleys uh, where there'll be small fields of beautiful Winooski or fine sandy loam in small pockets of a few acres here and there. Um, and, and those are ready, willing, and able for people who are doing intensive farming on high quality soils on pieces of land that the big farmers would just let grow up to brush. Earlier, the other Roger, thing is the manure, which we have too much of right now, and we, it's ending up in our, in our waters. Um, but I'm seeing more and more partnerships between large dairy farms who have more manure than they can get rid of. And they're looking at people who are growing, for example, grain for the malt house who do not have livestock and therefore without a source of manure, they're depleting uh, their, their soil. Um, final point I'd like to make in terms of the viability of some of these ideas. Uh, in, in the 1970s, when I graduated from high school, the maple syrup business in Vermont was almost dead. We had gone from making a million gallons of syrup 
to 200,000 gallons of syrup a year in the 70s. And I, I know we've grown at least tenfold. I have friends that maple sugaring is their full time what they do. They maybe only produce it for six weeks, but they're putting up pipeline, taking down pipeline, they're cutting firewood, they're thinning their forest, um, and, then, and then having these tremendous large operations that support, that support their families. Um, so when I look at the maple industry, uh, I realize that there are other opportunities um, that could be yeah. as big as 10x or more, because we've seen it just in my lifetime uh, with, with maple sugaring. I don't know, Roger, what do you think? Orly? Well, I, 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 I tell you, it doesn't need to be a division in, in agriculture in Vermont. They're all dependent on so many things together, whether it's the supply dealer or the equipment dealer or uh, what Clark just said about manure. Um, they're, they're all together in, in, in trying to make Vermont better. And, uh, and uh, small or large, I, I tell people when they say, well, you have a lot of large farms. I said, we don't have large farms in Vermont. If you want to see large farms, go out in Midwest or out West. All our farms are um, small by comparison. Yeah, and Orly? I think that, again, I'm going back to marketing. I think that uh, the more we tell our story, uh, and I think we've done a good job in explaining who's behind the food uh, we eat and what it takes to grow it. And once all people, including the federal government, fully understands how important it is, I think we'll be able to provide farmers with uh, more of the necessary livable wage that they rightfully should have. Um, I think it's going to take the federal government to provide some special programs for that, as they do in Canada, as they do in Europe, as they do all over the world. We're the richest country in the world. Food is our medicine. And the federal government needs to begin to understand that. David, oh, wow. just, one quick, just one quick thing. In early 2000, you probably remember this, National Geographic said that Vermont was a number five place in the world to visit. Um, and... Um, in, in, in all those things. And it was because we had a working landscape, we had quaint villages, and we had a plan for the future. And I said, I like the first two. I'm not sure where the plan for the future is. Well, I'm working on that, just to say, you know. <laughs> but but uh, no, I, I think a lot of this has been a great conversation. And, you know, there's often a division amongst sometimes non-farmers about what the right future for farming is in Vermont. And, you know, there is appropriate concern about our waterways, about labor conditions on some farms, and sometimes even animal husbandry, although I think there's a lot for people to learn about that too. Uh, and oftentimes it does come down to finances and we have had a societal push. Uh, Roger, you know the history better than anybody, but since the forties of a cheap food movement in order to uh, keep people fed, which is of course a, a very appropriate goal in governments, but it also has meant that uh, the externalities have not really been incorporated into the cost of that food. Uh, and I think in Vermont, we're seeing more of that conversation than in a lot of other places. And, and maybe under Orly's thoughts there in terms of federal involvement or state involvement, whether we can add um, supports to bring in the externalities but also pay farmers well enough that they don't have to push their fields to the very edge of the rivers, to not have to push their animals to the edge of their production capacity, to you know, do some of these things that frankly have been driven by the economics of the cheap food movement. Uh, but as we wrap up, um, I'm curious about you know, each one of you just for a minute, share the most important thing you think Vermont should be doing to grow our agricultural sector. Orly, let's start with you. Marketing and attracting young people. Wow, that was quick. You had a whole minute. You got anything else you want to throw in there? <laughs> if not, you can, we'll come back one last second. Clark, how about you? Uh, educating and attracting uh, young farmers. And continuing, we, we have to continue the conservation programs and current use. Um, because that gives farmers in Vermont a competitive edge 
because our land values, our land prices, and our land taxes uh, are, are the lowest in New England. And uh, the only place I can think of where the prices are lower is uh, parts of the Adirondack Park. Um, but even over there, their taxes are substantially higher than ours. We have to let people know that this is a good economic environment in which to farm. And if we ever mess that up, um, it'll be bad. But that's another story, Orly, that, that we aren't telling is that uh, we have some of the lowest property taxes on farmers uh, in the country. Then the, hey, only Roger. the one, one piece that I left out is so important for our higher eds to keep agricultural programs. Um, agriculture is, is a much more sophisticated uh, business than it used to be. Um, and cutting those programs uh, from our higher ed is a disaster. Yeah, and Roger? I, I would agree. I, I, I would agree, educating and attracting um, and, uh, and helping to finance young farmers uh, going forward. All farmers, they don't have to be young, they can be old too. <laughs> well, Clark, we were talking before the show about uh, how Adam can't be called a young farmer anymore. And at one point you helped me get on the Young Farmers and Ranchers Committee of the American Farm Bureau Federation, but <laughs> I don't qualify anymore either. Uh, definitely not under 35. Um, well, you're, you're not old enough to run for president. I'll say that. I'm older than 35. <laughs> you know um, what I mean. Well, I'm not running for president, so that's good. Um, so I do want to thank all three of you. I really appreciate it, uh, both this conversation, but really um, I feel honored to be with the three of you who have committed so much of your lives, both to your own agricultural operations and or the broader agricultural community in various capacities. Um, it's it's uh, really an honor to be sitting in this uh, <coughs> room with you having this conversation um, because I really do uh, cherish the knowledge and experience that you have and that you've brought for Vermont and that you continue to give to Vermont. And um, so thank you and I hope others who watch this uh, think about these three folks and, and some other real pioneers and leaders in our state. Um, we're actually going to continue our conversation about agriculture next Wednesday on June 10th at noon. I'm going to be joined by three farmers, uh, some of them in that young farmer category, sharing why they became farmers, uh, how they're making farming work, uh, both physically, mentally, and financially, uh, and what opportunities they see for the future of farming in Vermont. So if you have thoughts uh, or ideas that have stemmed from this conversation or you have other thoughts and ideas about future of agriculture in Vermont, the vision, the planning, as Roger talked about, uh, please do send them to me at info at Zuckerman4VT.com. That's info at Zuckerman4VT.com. And uh, thank you everyone who, uh, who's tuned in to this conversation on Facebook Live. And I hope you'll join me next week as we dive deeper into the ways that we can support our rural economy and agricultural heritage. So and thank, thank you, you again, thanks. Clark, thank Roger, you. Marley. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you for thank all you. you do, David. You bet. <laughs>